Her triumphs, I took a group of women that didn't believe in themselves and I just believed in them. Her trials, I never wanted to go to practice. I was losing a ton of weight. Her story, I just put my faith in God and just trusted the system. Her why, I want people to see what I did and say, oh, that's so awesome. I'm gonna be better than that. That would be how I hope that this journey ends. This is Her Why, where we tell the stories from BYU women's sports. Here is your host, Lauren McLean. Today's guests are sophomore track star Megan Hunter and her dad, Ian, who is a professor at BYU, talking about how she is overcoming serious adversity to make it back on track. Megan and Ian, thank you so much for being here with me today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Megan, you were involved in a car accident in 2019, right before the start of your first season on the BYU track team. You broke your neck. Which is crazy and very scary. How surprising <laughs> is it that you can walk in the studio right now and that you are a track athlete at BYU? Oh, it feels amazing. It has been a dream to be a track athlete at BYU for as long as I can remember. And there was a lot of uncertainty with that dream. Um, yeah, on July 4th of 2019. And so, yeah, it just it still kind of feels unreal a little bit just because of all that uncertainty that there was. But it's yeah, it's just a dream come true. I've loved every moment here. And you feel good? How are you feeling physically? Yeah, feeling pretty good. It definitely still gets sore <laughs> pretty often. Yeah. I have to be careful like with my backpack and having a backrest and all that. But um, yeah, overall, it really hasn't um, impacted uh, a lot of like what I can and can't do. So it's awesome. My recovery has has been much better than expected. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> so. All right, let's rewind a little bit before the accident. You grew up in a running family in Ian. You were a track athlete at BYU, and all your siblings ran competitively. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So was it gi well, given that you were going to be a runner <laughs> growing up? Yeah, it, I guess it was kind of what we all thought would happen. I I did some like little kid meets growing up, which was fun. But once I started doing cross country in high school, my freshman year, I was not a huge fan. I was like, oh no, I might have to break the family tradition. This is <laughs> not super fun. But just a couple weeks into it, I started to realize how much I loved it, like just the social aspect of it. And it was just so fun, like such a rewarding feeling to be able to run and um, get like those post-workout feels. <laughs> it was awesome. And then uh, after cross country season, my freshman year of high school, um, being able to do track and events that I was more interested in just really made me excited. So yeah, I, I've kind of loved it since the beginning, except the very beginning. But, <laughs> <laughs> except yeah. the very, very beginning. What was it about that very beginning stage that you're like, okay, this isn't for me? It was so hard. Running is hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, it does take a lot of discipline to like get up um, during, yeah, during my freshman year of high school, we would get up at 7 a.m. in the summer. And um, yeah, it was hard. But my older sister was on the team when I started and that helped a lot that we were able to go to practice together and yeah. uh, make new friends there. So, yeah, it was awesome. Ian, what kind of runner was Megan growing up? Was she just a naturally good runner? <laughs> um, there's a lot of stories behind that with her running technique. Okay. That, uh, a lot of people thought, how is she so fast when she runs like that? <laughs> and I'm supposed to be the biomechanics expert in running and here's my child and they're wondering, well, why can't he figure it out for her? <laughs> but she would run these amazing times. So the thought was, hey, if the times are there, it doesn't matter if her head's wobbling or whatever's going on. And so we, we always knew there was some great talent for speed, especially. And then she showed it in, in other areas too. Wow. So you study running mechanics as part of your job at BYU. So you mentioned that her mechanics were a little bit off. What types of things was she doing? The things that were often brought up were more upper body focused. Her lower body was doing really good things for what yeah. we believe we know about yeah. running technique. But just like her dad and her brother, there was this head wobble going on all the time. And um, there was so much intensity and effort and determination, especially at the end of the race when she was tired, that you'd see these extra bit of movements going on that I think were just a result of that and maybe partly the genetics too. 
Megan, you were a decorated runner at Provo High School. You were named the Gatorade State Player of the Year for women's track and field in 2017 and 18. How did it feel to be the only girl in Utah to have won four individual titles? That was super exciting. Um, all season, it was something that I really wanted to to achieve, and I knew I had a lot of people believing in me. And so, yeah, just finishing that last race um, to get that that title was just such an incredible feeling. And you know, I felt like I had put a lot of work into it, and so it was cool to be able to kind of see it all all come together. But yeah, I really couldn't have done it without my great teammates and coaches and family. So. Yeah, there, there was a lot of support behind um, that accomplishment, and it was it was just a really good feeling. <laughs> so I'm so curious about all this, these mechanic, you know, things that you were mm-hmm. doing. Was this something you realized you were doing, but you're just like, I'm just running? Oh, yeah. People made sure I was very aware of it. <laughs> um, I was told I had the, the grace of a three-legged donkey and <laughs> other <laughs> things gosh. like that. Um, Thank but, you. <laughs> yes, it's such a compliment. But yeah, I, I was very aware that it was going on. Like I, I could recognize my head was bobbling, but it was it was hard to stop that. Um, and we would do some things in practice to try to kind of help a little bit, make me a little more more smooth and, and structured while I ran. But yeah, honestly, there there wasn't a ton <laughs> that yeah. helped my my form. I was aware of it, but but yeah. when did you realize I'm pretty fast? Um. I, there was a race my freshman year and it was the race that qualified me for state. And, um, before that happened during indoor season, everything, I wasn't like, I was, I was good, but I wasn't like great. And I remember my older sister, Kate had just signed to BYU and I thought that was just the coolest thing. But I was like, oh man, there's like, I, I really doubt that'll ever be me, but that would be awesome if it was. But I feel like I started kind of believing that that could be a thing um, my freshman year when I was able to qualify for state. And yeah, it was it was a super fun race. And I realized like, oh, maybe like I can be good like Kate is. And You were recruited by USC and Oregon, which are powerhouses in college track. And then you decided to go to BYU. So obviously mm-hmm. your sister went there. But why did you choose BYU for yourself? Yeah, so originally it was just what I always knew I wanted to do. But once other schools started reaching out to me, I was like, oh, wow, there are other options. <laughs> and um, it was actually a hard decision. You know, after my visit to USC, I like just wanted to cry because I loved it there so much. I was mm. like, dang it, I have to like make a hard decision now. Um, but the the more I thought about it and um, talked it over with people that I trusted, I realized that BYU was was the place for me. I think the biggest thing was just the people there. Um, I just loved the team culture and atmosphere here at BYU. And um, there are a lot of great things about Coach Taylor. She's def- she's a very unique coach. Like there are a lot of things that she has that other coaches don't. And so I think the biggest thing that set BYU apart for me was just the people there. Um, and yeah, that's that's what helped me decide on BYU. And there have been so many experiences along the way during my collegiate career that have made me realize that I I really did make the right choice. Then on July 4th, as you mentioned, 2019, you got into a terrible car accident that changed your life forever, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. What happened that day? Yeah, my older brother and I were on our way to Timer Road Race. And it was still very early in the morning, so a little bit dark. And we were driving, uh, we had driven past Provo Canyon, almost to Park City, when we turned a corner and there was a deer. And my brother was driving and he overcorrected to miss the deer. The deer's okay, so <laughs> that's good. Well, that's um, good. <laughs> but yeah, he overcorrected and the car ended up rolling several times. And yeah, we just landed in this field. And luckily my brother was able to help me get out of the car through through the sunroof, which was shattered. And uh, uh, we didn't realize how serious the injuries are at all. I Like I told myself, I just had whiplash, like, oh, it's fine. Like I'm not paralyzed or dead. So I yeah. think I think my neck's okay. <laughs> it's just <Yeah>. whiplash. <laughs> um, but luckily there was such a great passerby that stopped and um, called the paramedics for us and yeah. So did you think you needed to go to the hospital? 
no. <laughs> well, our plan was that we were going to have my parents come up. My dad was going to take my brother um, to time the race. My mom was going to take me to Instacare just to check me out just in case. Um, but yeah, we, we told my parents like, oh yeah, the car is on its side and like Megan's neck hurts, but she's okay. And <laughs> like, we'll be fine. So yeah, I, I, we were both in a lot of shock and we both just wanted to assume the best. And so we didn't think anything was that serious originally. So when the doctors tell you, you broke your neck, what were your mm -hmm. thoughts? Um, yeah, I, so once I had gotten into the ambulance and like I was on the spine board and the neck brace, I started thinking like, oh, maybe this is a little more serious. Like I'm starting to hurt pretty bad and mm -hmm. like, <laughs> I can't move my neck at all. Um, but I was still like kind of in a little bit of denial when they told me like, you broke your neck. Um, and yeah, most, mostly it was just a lot of shock and denial. Um, but right before I was going to be life flighted to be to a hospital that specialized more in neck surgery, um, I asked my dad, I said, am I going to be okay? And he said, yeah, you're going to be okay. And that's like one of those memories that's just like ingrained in my mind. Like, yeah, I'm going to be okay. So like, when, when I found out that I had broken my neck, it was a lot of like shock, but at the same time, I was able to feel a lot of peace. And I think a lot of that was because of that simple conversation that I don't even know if you remember. I remember it very clearly. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I remember it super clearly as well, but I felt like he understood what okay meant to me. And so I, I trusted that he knew I was going to be okay. So I was going to be okay. So, yeah. Parents have incredible powers, don't they? Ian... <laughs> What were your thoughts when you initially found out about the accident? All we knew at first at 4.50 in the morning was that the car was on its side, like Megan said. We didn't know the severity of the crash, but we pulled up there at the uh, site, and I stepped out of the car and saw the scene and thought, that car didn't just tip over. It's really far in that field. Yeah. And the ambulance is there. Couldn't quite see Megan, but I stepped out of the car and had this complete feeling of peace that everything's going to be all right somehow. And so I remember that conversation well with Megan, and I was cleaning up all this equipment that was all over the field for timing that race. And my wife called and said, we need to have her life flighted to Provo. So that added some anxiety, a huge amount to me. But I f flew there with Megan from uh, Park City to Provo in the, the life flight. And as m many bad things as the doctor who became the surgeon for us shared with us and showed us on the, the scans, there still was this thought of everything's going to be okay, even mm -hmm. though three vertebrae are shattered. And the, the spinal cord was not as straight as it should be. But there that peaceful feeling remained and then through all those struggles of weeks and months of physical trials uh, the the peace from that little conversation mm -hmm. and other things really helped so when you told megan everything's going to be okay you sincerely meant it you felt it oh yeah i i definitely had that anxiety and worry of is this really what i should be saying but um, it still felt right. And there's been a lot of little events and some big ones along the way that have made me feel comfort and that was the right thing to say. How close were you to paralysis? Did the doctors ever tell you that? Um, I don't think you got told everything. Yeah, I, I remember um, the, Maybe the doctors didn't want were, to know. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know. I wanted to know, but no one else wanted me to know. I guess I was in a room um, after I was life flighted and my older sister was was there with me. And um, I had my coach and a neighbor, and my grandparents and parents outside of the room talking to the doctor. And I kept asking um, Kate, like, oh, like, will you go out there and at least like see if they're crying? Like what's going on? <laughs> I think I was left in the dark a lot yeah. originally, but... Yeah. yeah, we were looking at the uh, CT scan, and it showed a vertebral artery that was partially severed, which was a 
big worry for blood clots and so on, and the spinal cord being a bit misshapen, and a bunch of just broken vertebrae. C5 was just in, in pieces. And the doctor is saying some things that weren't encouraging. He did mm -hmm. say she might be able to start running in a year or two. And Coach Taylor was there with us too. And we're all gathered around learning and worrying and I'm about to pass out. And oh. uh, <laughs> But <sighs> what, in that moment, uh, you know, he, he was a pretty good guess. A few other surgeons that looked said, yeah, a year or two, she might be able to start running again. But that same surgeon cleared her to run six months later. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so initially, Megan, when you heard that, like, it mm -hmm. might be a few years before you can run again. What was going through your mind? Um, You know, there was some disappointment, but at the same time, I... I knew I had to get to a place in my life where even if I wasn't able to run competitively like I was before, that I was going to be okay. And so I tried to really focus on other things that were going well in my life. And, you know, obviously I really wanted to get back on the track and I, I did everything that I could um, to be able to do that. But at the same time, I knew I had to get to a place in my life where I would be okay um, not being able to to continue that dream, which which was hard, but I think it made the recovery easier to to be able to just kind of accept yeah. that that potential reality. Yeah. So, what inspired you to not give up on the dream of running, even though mm -hmm. you mentally have prepared yourself like this may not be an option? What inspired you to keep going and training? Yeah. Um, Coach Taylor's group of runners, we have this motto: "Run for her." And it means to run for the little girl that dreamed. And I just kept remembering little Megan, like wanting this so bad. And I just wanted to make her proud and do it for her. And I, I think that was the biggest thing that got me through was just, yeah, imagining little Megan, knowing that she would want this as well as future Megan. You know, I want future Megan to be able to look back and, and be proud. And I know there are other areas in my life that, that I can do this with. And I have had a lot of um, times where I've had to kind of do a reality check and be like, is this actually worth it? Because, you know, even though I was able to start running six months later, there have still been a lot of um, challenges and hardships related to the accident and and not with running. And so I've had to do a lot of reality checks with like, oh, do I really want to keep running? Like, is it worth it? But I've, I've just kind of realized that it is. This is what I want to be doing. And I know it's what uh, past and future Megan wants me to be doing. And along with that, like, I've just had so much family support telling me that, like, yeah, you you can do it. I know they would love me whether or not <laughs> I was running, um, but, you know, they, they want to support me in my dreams. And something that's cool that goes along with the conversation um, that I had with my dad initially after the accident, um, my so my dad's dad, my late grandfather, it was his car that was... Um, involved in the crash and um my brother and I both agreed that we kind of like felt his presence there at the crash and since then like when when I think of my conversation with my dad like you're going to be okay sometimes I imagine my late grandfather telling me like you're going to be okay you're going to be okay and so that's something that helps motivate me and and just kind of shows me that yeah I'll I'll be okay. This is a good path for me. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll learn how Megan slowly made it back onto the track after her accident. I'm Lauren McLean, and I'm here with sophomore BYU track star Megan Hunter and her dad, Ian. Megan, how long after the accident did you start rehabbing? Um... So I definitely got some some time off, just kind of <laughs> chilling in bed for a while. Um, the the first thing that I started doing, you know, I was still in neck brace. I would go on walks every day, and these walks were actually kind of pretty hard <laughs> to go yeah. on to to motivate myself to to get up and go on the walk. But my my little brother John, he was such a sweetheart. He would go on these walks with me, and. Um, yeah, we would we had this loop that we would go on, and that's kind of what initially that was the only thing that I could do. And you know, 
after walking for too long, I would start to get pretty tight and we had to, to make it back. But slowly but surely, I was able to go a little further each day, which was encouraging. And then um, it was probably about a couple months after that, I was able to start getting on the bike. Um, Coach Taylor gave me some some intense bike workouts <laughs> um, to just kind of... I think it was more like for the mental part of things yeah. than physical. You know, there's only so much you can do working out on a bike. But, you know, it was good to be able to feel like, okay, yeah, I'm I'm getting into shape. It's it's going to be all right. So was that basically the rehab for those six months before you started running again? It was the mm-hmm. bike and walking? Yeah, it was, it was the bike and walking. Um, there wasn't a ton else that I could do. Um, but BYU has a great training facility and I was able to run on their, it's called a HydroWorks treadmill. So yeah, just running Mm -hmm. in water. I was able to do that, um, a little bit before I started running on ground before. So that was, that was such an exciting day being able to (laughs) (laughs) run in water in like slow motion, but it was still running. So it was awesome. Ian, what was it like for you watching Megan go through this process? It was really, really challenging and really exciting, all mixed mm-hmm. in, like Megan's good and bad days. Yeah. It, it was that kind of feeling. But to go to the, um, now it's a BYU track, but the old Provo High track and help her do her first workout, it was just me and her out there and a few random people. And watching mm-hmm. her run that first 200-meter interval that Coach had prescribed for her, um, I was filming it in high speed video and getting all excited. <laughs> and it was so interesting to see how rigid and straight her back and neck were. And so we brought her in the lab and measured uh, everything we could and compared that a couple months later and started seeing that relaxed movement mm-hmm. start coming back again. And uh, so I, I guess the primary part for me was being her dad and trying to help in whatever way I could think of. But it was fun to be included a bit in some of the, uh, I would call it biomechanical aspects of how can we get recovered. And a really interesting observation that came across from this surgeon, the day after the accident, he went home And Coach Taylor had explained, this is who you're working with. He didn't know who she was in terms of her abilities. He went home and watched some videos that were online available to see of state meets and so on. And he said, when we looked at the scans, her first cervical vertebrae had an imperfection in it. And he said, this wasn't from the accident. This is maybe born like this. Maybe that's why her head wobbles and tilts to one side more than the other. Yeah, and so we maybe had that answer. Oh, maybe that's why she moved differently than some people mm. thought she should. And so anyway, taking all those parts along the way was just really fascinating to see what's going on, but also motivating to see she's gradually returning to how she used to move, which implied there's some good things going on in terms of this recovery. You never thought you'd be so happy to see her head wobble again, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a good thing. Yep. How long did it take for you to physically feel competitive again? Um, I, I've always had like competitive energy in me, um, <laughs> especially like, you know, board and card games. I, I get really into those. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that that never went away. But as far as running goes, um, once I was able to like get back on the track again and, and compete, it was um, just over a year and a half after the accident that I was competing again. Um, I just, I felt that competitiveness come back and, um, yeah, it helped show me that like, yeah, this, this is what I want to be doing. And it was exciting to be able to, to compete again. Um, but there have been a lot of, you know, physical and mental challenges along the way with that. About a year and a half after the accident, I started having symptoms of PTSD. Mm -hmm. And so that's been, that's impacted kind of my my mental ability (laughs) to run, I think, um, since then. And that's, that's been a journey, but through all of that, um, yeah, I still just get excited that I am, I'm able to still compete on the track. Let's talk about that PTSD. When you started to experience that, how did that affect your life and your running? Yeah, I, I never imagined that 
the mental aspect of this would be harder to to overcome than the physical part of the accident. But I remember the very first panic attack that I had, it was while I was an alternate at Indoor Nationals. And I I told myself after that panic attack, like, oh, that was just a one-time thing. I don't know how that happened, what happened. Uh, But, you know, it won't happen again. But then it just kept occurring. I think I had like three or four more the following week Mm. after that. And I realized like, okay, this is something serious that I need to need to figure out. And so um, after therapy and doctor's appointments, um, that following semester, fall semester, I I was so scared to even go into class because I was nervous that I was going to be triggered by something Mm -hmm. that was said. So I always had like an exit plan. I would sit right next to the door and it was just so hard to focus and it, it became a lot harder to get the grades that I wanted to. And then as far as running goes, um, we would often race in places like Oregon where it rains a lot. (laughs) And that was a big trigger of mine was just Mm. rain. And so I was often so just like overstimulated and um, just so nervous about even driving to the track to go Mm. compete that it really impacted my my performances as well. Um, And just the stress of everything um, just kind of got to my head like that I was stressed about racing as well and so yeah it really it impacted it impacted my my performance as well as just life in general going to class was hard um you know even like going to church some people would talk about like car accidents and I would just Mm -hmm. kind of freak out I have to leave a little bit early um but yeah it's at the same time like you know, it has been a blessing to be able to look back and realize like, wow, I've I've come a long way with that. And I've had a lot of help along the way to recover from that. And yeah. Obviously, with anything with mental health, it's, it's most likely a lifelong journey that you can slowly improve mm-hmm. on. How do you feel like you're doing now with all of that? Yeah, I'm definitely doing much better. Um, it was a little over a year that I felt very, very impacted by it. And, you know, I felt like I was doing everything that I could and I didn't feel like things were getting much better. Um, I started doing EMDR therapy, which is super neat, super cool. At first I thought it was kind of voodoo, but it's like very backed up by science and everything. And it was, it was super neat. And that's what really um, helped me the most. And now like, you know, I still can get triggered by things, but I definitely able to control it a lot better and um, something that was discouraging at first is knowing that it is really a lifelong journey and it won't get all the way better you know I'll never feel the same way about like car accidents that I did Mm -hmm, before mm -hmm. my PTSD symptoms Um, but the fact that you know there's a lot of help out there to to be able to navigate it and um, even just talking to people who have had similar experiences as me um, makes me realize that, yeah, we're we're all going to be OK. It's yeah. going to be OK. And it's it's hard. Um, but I've been lucky with just great people around me who have who have wanted to help me um, through it. And I've had to learn that progress isn't linear. Um, mm-hmm. There are definitely a lot of ups and downs. And, you know, that's just part of mental health. That's just something that happens. And it used to be really discouraging that I feel like I had just climbed a giant mountain and then had to sled down it and have to work up it again. But um, yeah, it's just so important to me to remember that progress isn't linear and there will be ups and downs. But overall, if if I'm working on getting better, then I'm in the right direction. How often have your dad's words from the night of the accident mm-hmm. echoed in your brain? It's going to be okay. <laughs> A lot, a lot of the time, especially, you know, right before a race, that's, that's what goes through my mind. You know, it's, it's going to be okay. And I know that it's going to be okay. doesn't mean that it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows and not everything is going to be perfect because, you know, things have not been perfect, but it's all, it's all been okay. And I know it's going to be okay. And, um, you know, sometimes it's okay to not be okay, but just knowing that it will be okay um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> helps me a lot. And so, yeah, th- those words come pretty often. And I try to remember that when I get um, really discouraged. Ian, what does that mean to you that those those simple words that you said on that night have impacted her for years to come? Those words were pretty 
simple and short, and there wasn't a whole lot of thought that went into it prior. So it, it's pretty amazing the impact that can have the, uh, on Megan, but also on me in, in whatever aspects of life. So I'm glad that it was able to be something that helped Megan multiple times. That's that's a wonderful thing to hear. But also realizing, yeah, there are a lot of challenges along the way. So if there's some little phrase that can help strengthen as that progress is going on and those hard, the, the valleys and the mountains as those come by, um, if everyone can have something that they can look back to that helps, then that's, that's a wonderful thing. Amazing. Megan, looking back at your very first race after the accident, when you completed that race, was it crying? Was it laughter? <laughs> was it relief? What were you feeling? Yeah, well, right before the race, it it was tears. I was very emotional. Um, <laughs> my my team was all there, like this is so exciting. Like you get to do this. I'm like, yeah, I do. And I was I was so excited and and so nervous, but mostly just so grateful that I was able to do this. And you know, obviously, first race back was not, you know, time wise wasn't the race that I wanted. But like it, everything about it was the race (laughs) that I wanted I guess looking back um you know just to be able to wear that BYU uniform and being able to to run for her for little Megan um was just such a blessing and I was just filled with so much gratitude for that race being able to have the opportunity to to come back and um you know start competing again not only have you gotten back to where you were at but you have been able to go above and beyond. How did that feel when you were able to set personal records after Mm -hmm. this long journey? Yeah, it's been super, super exciting. Um, Because, yeah, like like we've said, there was a lot of uncertainty and we really didn't know where where things would go. And so being able to see my name on the top 10 board and be able to um, break school records with my teammates in, in relays has just been such a rewarding feeling and um you know I try I try not to be too tied to the outcome um but it is it definitely is exciting to to see that my hard work has been paying off in that way um and yeah it's just just such a great feeling it just makes me look back on you know Megan on July 4th of 2019 and just telling her that, yeah, it's it's okay. That oh. Things are good. How far you've come three years later. What advice would you give somebody who is maybe struggling to recover or just kind of struggling in life to overcome their challenges? What advice mm-hmm. would you give them? Um, what I said earlier about progress isn't linear. Um, I feel like I was in a really dark place when I first heard that quote. Um I I had a therapist tell me like, Megan, you're doing great. Like you're doing all the right things and your mindset is pretty good. But there is one thing that I think you need to change. And that's that you need to remember that progress isn't linear and um, there will be good days and bad days. And, you know, you just have to focus on the good days. And, you know, that's a lot easier said than done. But yeah, it's just so important to, to remember and look back at how far you've come even when you are in one of those dark places and um life is full of opportunities to kind of get more more tools in that tool belt to to help you overcome those challenges so it's just important to to remember how far you've come and you know how far you can go ian how has your daughter inspired you (laughs) You can tell there's been some really great lessons that are instilled in Megan now that are very deep and meaningful. And I I often wondered, can we go back in time and change all this? We'd miss out on a lot of things. And I still think, yeah, I'd like to go back and change it all. But there's been such great lessons learned. When Whenever we go off to speak at sports camps or do a high school, things like that. Um, It's always uh, inspiring to me to see Megan's ability to share an experience that's very hard, but have these 
lessons that she's learned along the way taught to these youth and others. So it, it's been really inspiring for me. And a lot of the lessons that she's learned are things that I hadn't considered so much before. So it, it also helps me. We're here with BYU track and field star Megan Hunter and her dad, Ian, who is a BYU professor. Megan and Ian, thank you so much for coming on with me and sharing your this incredibly personal and just just inspiring journey with me and uh, with our audience. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can download and listen to all episodes of Her Why on the BYU Radio app or wherever you find podcasts. Her Why is a production of BYU Radio.